My name is Michael Speaks. I'm uh, Dean of the School of Architecture. I don't usually introduce myself uh, in this building, but we have a lot of visitors tonight, so thank you all for, for coming. Um, I'm, I'm simply going to uh, thank a few people, and we'll have introductions for the panel uh, shortly. Um, as you all know, there are a series of events that have been occurring and that will continue to occur. Uh, you may have seen this uh, pamphlet that lists all the events. The events are also on a couple of different websites. They're on the School of Architecture websites, uh, but I think they're also on the... Um, uh, maybe they're... Are they on the VPA website too? Yeah, yes, yeah. They're on the VPA website. So the, so, the, so the events are around. You probably have seen some of them. I hope you'll see more. We're also doing a microsite, so once the... Because we have so many different events and there are so many different, let's say, means of capturing events. Some are small, some are large. There's video capture, there's photography. Once everything is done, it'll be archived on a microsite. So even if you miss things, you'll be able to see uh, a lot of things that you might not have seen already. Um, so I'm going to uh, thank a couple of people quickly. I wrote their names here so I wouldn't remember. That's not very easy to... Here. <laughs> but first and foremost, I want to thank them. So, uh, oh, sorry. Your, your captioning is not up yet. Sorry? There, is, it, is there supposed to be captioning on the screen? Yeah. Is it not working? Oh, is it not working? <laughs> I don't see it. Is it working? Okay, it's working. All right, fine. Uh, uh, so I want to uh, just make a few. Uh, Quick thank yous and then we'll get on with the event. Um, first, I want to uh, uh, thank Ms. Sogura. We're very, very, very happy she's here. Um, and uh, you, she, she'll get a formal introduction in a second with Yutaka, but we're very, very, very pleased she's here for, I think, about 10 days. Um, I also want to thank uh, a couple of people who were instrumental in putting together the exhibition, which you can't see yet, but you will see as soon as we're done. This is supposed to start at 5.30, we'll be done at about 6.30, and that will open, and uh, there'll be food and, and, and other, and probably adult beverages. Um, um, but also, uh, you'll be able to see the show, and one of the centerpieces of the show is an incredible piece of furniture that was uh, designed by Papa, but was built uh, by our staff downstairs, including John Bryant, but mostly by uh, Mike Genitancio and Thomas and Austin, yes. I know them. I don't know why I had to read that. Thomas and Austin. In, in any case, they did an incredible job building this piece, and when you see it, you'll, you will be, um, you'll be amazed. Um, so I don't want to say any more than that, except thank you all. Thanks to Ed, uh, to Ed uh, and Yutaka, and most especially uh, to you all for coming tonight. Thanks to all the students who have worked to put this together. Um, I look forward to the discussion. And I will leave it to Ed to make the rest of the introductions. Thank you. Testing one, two, three. Am I on? Thank you. Okay, so this is fun. Um, all right, so I'm Edward Morris, and I'm um, co director of the Canary Lab at Syracuse. Never mind what that is. <laughs> um, and professor in the transmedia department within the College of Visual and Performing Arts. Um, with Yutaka Show, one of the co organizers of um, this program. Um, so before beginning um, my introduction to this panel, uh, I first want to acknowledge that Syracuse University sits on sacred Onondaga nation land, and we honor and respect that. And our memory of that has particular resonance uh, given our discussion tonight regarding the telling of history and trauma. Thank you. I like that mic cutting out. Uh, that's also kind of appropriate. Uh, it's kind of a harsh transition, but then I also want to thank our funders and supporters. Um, so there was such overwhelming support across departments within the university um, and indeed outside it that actually I really can't list them all. But Dean Michael Speaks really deserves a uh, special mentioning. It's not just his financial support for the project, but really he was a true collaborator throughout and he's been a passionate supporter of it. So thank you, Michael. Um, and uh, I also want to acknowledge the uh, Japan Foundation, the Humanities Center, the College of Visual and Performing Arts, and the East Asia Program, and the Moynihan Institute of Global Affairs, all of which were key sponsors of this. Okay, so tonight we've assembled a artist, 
an architect and an activist. So it's kind of like a butcher, baker, and candlestick maker kind of thing. Um, and we have Keiko Ogura, who's a storyteller and survivor of the Hiroshima atomic bomb attack in 1945, whom Yutaka will formally introduce in a moment. As well as Annette Behrens, uh, a German-born photographer living and working in the Netherlands. And Linda Zhang, an architect and Boghossian fellow here at Syracuse University. Uh, both of them I will formally introduce right after we hear from Ms. Ifura. Um, you might also notice that like all the panelists are women. Um, so I'm obviously just here to satisfy certain diversity requirements. <laughs> um, so our panel concerns memory and the shaping of history. Uh, in particular, the shaping of history by people who are not themselves uh, agents of the state or professional historians. We want to focus on the different methods for doing that um, and why that kind of thing might be important. As Michael said, this panel is part of a larger event that day now, and I just want to draw attention to a couple of the uh, events for that. So principally, uh, one of the more interesting things we're going to do is on October 30th, in the room right here, the marble room right behind us, um, Ms. Ogura will be um, speaking in private conversations, so either one person or groups up to three that will be scheduled. So if you're interested in speaking with Ms. Ogura, which will be a very meaningful experience, I suggest you sign up. And actually, spaces are going pretty quickly for that. So the way you sign up is you email, get ready to take this down, that day now at gmail.com. Um, and so that, that email address will also be on various posters that you can see. So. Um, so Ms. Ogura will also be at the Eberson Museum for an open conversation and Q&A from 5.30 to 7.30 this Thursday, uh, October 26th. That's another opportunity to speak with her in person more uh, robustly. And there's an ongoing and changing exhibition at the Eberson that students in the class that you talk and I are co-teaching are putting together. There'll be an, a reception for that on November 16th, but I suggest you go down to the Eberson, which is just, they have some phenomenal exhibits there anyway, so if you're there, check out what we're doing as well. And lastly, I want to mention that there's a full day symposium here in Slocum on Saturday that looks at uh, the impact of the A-bomb attack on Japanese culture, contemporary culture. Okay, so the way we're going to proceed here is uh, Yutaka is going to introduce Ms. Ogura right now. And Ms. Ogura will speak to us for a few minutes. And then I'll introduce the other two panelists. Um, everyone's going to make a brief overview of one aspect of their work. Uh, and then, you know, we're going to talk in a, you know, a panel-y kind of way. And so you talk and I have some questions. You're going to have some questions, right? Um, and then we'll all learn from one another. So thank you very much, and we'll start the panel. Don't clap. <laughs> uh, hello? Can you, am I on? Hello, yes. <laughs> um, before I introduce Ms. Ogura, please speak. Thank you so much for everything you've done for this event. Okay, here I go. Um, I'm sorry I'm gonna have to read. It's too big of a deal to screw up, so I don't wanna do that. Um, so I'm going to read this. Uh, forgive me. Okay, here we go. Having Ms. Ogura here is like facing a ghost. Of course, Ms. Ogura does not look anything like a ghost at all, and she's more energetic than any of us, as you will find out. Um, but, I am referring here to the work of Madalena Nicolaescu on ghosts as understood by Jack Derrida. Nicolaescu states, what Derrida thinks to be of crucial importance about the ghost is its status as a revenant, as a spirit that keeps coming back. Repetition disrupts the view of a linear temporality that presupposes a smooth passage from the past to the present and further on to the future. So having Ms. Ogura here is like facing the ghost in five different ways. She's like a ghost because she was supposed to die on that day, August 6, 1945, in Hiroshima. Appearing before you in America, she's the antithesis to 72 years of denial, censorship, ignorance, incomprehension for the magnitude of violence that could end all life on Earth many times. In the A-bomb heat equal to the sun's core, she was supposed to have died that day, and her return inspires a sense of awe. She's like a ghost because even though she survived the heat, blast, fire, and the radiation, she's supposed to be far away on that remote island. 
She's not supposed to communicate directly with you about her experience in English, which she taught herself after she was 42 years old. <laughs> she should have been forgotten, but here she is. She's like a ghost because she stands with 200,000 people who perished that day in Hiroshima, 100,000 since then, and many more who live with its trauma today. But Mizogura did not come here for revenge. Last year in Hiroshima, when we first met when I took my SU abroad students, she asked me to bring back more American youth. She said she wanted to ask them how best to communicate her experience. Should she show images, conduct a play, or talk to them one-on-one. -on -one. Because she will not be around for long, she's ready to leave pieces of herself so she may return to us after her body's gone. She makes us take ghosts ser seriously, the ghosts from the future. When we think about the global risks that affect all of us, regardless of race, gender, class, or geography, like radiation, climate change, or financial meltdown, Ghosts from the future keep coming back and ask, what will you have done to us? The question will be in the future anterior tense, because the answer is undetermined and depends on what we will do immediately after this night. Finally, she urges us to face ghosts, because after Hiroshima in 1945, and again after Fukushima in 2011, we know that there could be a ghost in each one of us. Internal radiation lacks comprehensive research, it is undetectable and unpredictable, and manifests, manifests inconsistently even if you are at the same place at the same time. You may even share the same genes. Yet, how symptoms manifest is unknowable. This means that we all live with the invisible other inside of us. Without Ms. Agura's physical presence here, we would not have been able to feel the ghosts that have always surrounded us. Now we know that the air was never empty. We also know that we can create alliances with ghosts. Embracing and working closely with ghosts is our best bet in deflecting global risks. Please join me on the journey into the five ghostly realms with Keiko Ogura. Well, thank you so much uh, to be given such a precious time. And uh, she is so strict, uh, always watching clock, and uh, I shouldn't uh, talk too much. And uh, after coming here, I met so many eager uh, people here from Syracuse, from young to the aged. I have a wonderful time. Today, I will introduce one uh, the very peculiar, very uh, meaningful act. In Hiroshima, in Peace Park, around other Peace Park, uh, there are many uh, monuments, mostly uh, the made by uh, artists. But uh, there are only two monuments built by fundraising of students. One is well known as Statue of Children, where you can see paper crane that was made by elementary school level students and, uh, for, and uh, junior high level. But uh, there is another one, not so many know that. Uh, could you show me? Okay, I'll tell you later. Show me. <laughs> yeah. And then there is a monument, a monument of Hiroshima. Hiroshima no hi, we say, uh, along the riverbank by the Peace Park, it is said. Why it is so unique is from that monument, it's not a monument, but the activity of peace activity started. Already you know, seven rivers after the bomb were full of uh, dead and the dying people. And then we think how, how they died, and we think of the heat and the, uh, you know, blast and the heat and uh, attacked us. But uh, 
student, the high school student thought of actually visual way how to sense, how to share uh, the heat of the victims had. Okay? Oh, why? This is the center. I myself, I was eight years old that time. <laughs> no. <laughs> and this is uh, right after the bomb. The right after, I should say, two, two months after the bomb. So Hiroshima City and the God uh, were given four pictures, four di directions from American government and they put together and uh, this picture was made. So everywhere was completely destroyed like this. Now we are facing at the west area. Okay, this is the Hiroshima City, you know, and uh, I lived the northern area over there, but uh, this time, I lived that time one and a half miles away from the hypocenter. But this time, I want to tell you the activity of the students. So what they did, many people like this, uh, did died in the river, but the, the, the river and the the floor, the bottom of the floor, there are not only and the people's and the remains, remains were there, but there are so many roof tiles, burned roof tiles, heated like 2,000, 3,000 Celsius degree and more than 3,000 to 4,000. Students wanted to know how hot those days people were and burned. So students try to dig, try to gather a roof tiles from the bottom of the rivers. And then they got burned roof tiles, turned to red, turned to brown. And then what they did, they started a very unique experiment. So they uh, prepare uh, brand new roof tiles, brown, uh, the black roof tiles. And then they uh, brought uh, and the uh, roof tiles they found from the river. And they started to burn with the burner. And they waited 1,000, you know, and they burned until the exact color changed. Exactly like and the burned roof tile, that's over thousand and the over two thousand, and then they found the new roof tile started to bubbling. You see, and then students found how those people who were burned right under the the bomb, atomic bomb, then. That was a very unique uh, piece of activity. And they're using those roof tile, and uh, you see, this is really big. They made, doing fundraising by themselves, this monument, you see? And uh, those, on this monument, actually roof tiles are used. And uh, the other side of this monument, there is a picture of students and the teacher actually at the finding and the work in the river. Very unique one. And then this is the start. From that, students started to work various peace activities to convey not only using not, not only using roof tiles, but like the barks of the trees. They cut and uh, revived the box of the tree and they sent so many people and the people could feel touching the box, part of the box of the tree, exposed to the tree. And uh, like that, from now on, soon, there won't be any witnesses like me. I'm 80 years old, but uh, every year 
and uh, witness are uh, dying in my group, and uh, there were five uh, survivors, uh, five people, and uh, telling the story every year. But every year they passed. Finally, I'm the only one. Uh, it occurred. So in the future, near future, all the witnesses of the hell will disappear. Then what shall we do? We have to think. My answer is, you know, we need really good imagination power. If our imagination power is a power let the people think to create something new and then give others think about and then do something. Every year uh, I have been talking about my story to many uh, foreign students, foreign people. Last year, over 360,000 foreigners came this is the second to the first, next to uh, Kyoto, uh, Fushimi, Inari also, that's the number one. Why people are coming? They were afraid their memory will disappear before and all the witnesses are gone. They wanted to come and they wanted to listen to my story. So, and uh, so today, and uh, here, we are thinking about uh, how to convey our hearts to prevent such evil from now on. And uh, I'm so happy to be given such an idea. Is it okay? Is it inside? <laughs> okay, thank you so much. Please remember this monument. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, okay, so next I uh, want to introduce Annette Behrens. Um, so uh, Annette Behrens is a visual artist living in the Netherlands, as I mentioned, who works with photography, video, installation, and text. Her work is intensive and research-based. She traverses the fields of history, visual arts, journalism, and more recently in her work on the soy plant, uh, science. She was raised in Germany, it's written that her consciousness of the history of that country, particularly its experience under Nazi rule, has been formative in her work, which she'll talk about in a second. It has led to an interest in our quote, and I'm quoting Annette here, our complicated judgmental relationship towards the quote other, and where such attitudes of inclusion and exclusion can lead, unquote. So Annette uh, is going to talk about a book called The Matter of Carl, which was named one of the best photography books of 2015 by Time Magazine. And in naming the book to that honor, um, uh, they wrote, this is a nuanced, complex, and extraordinarily forthright book that contains rigorous, insightful, and evocative research. Barron's book compels us to deal with the dangers of a forgetful relationship to our past, as well as to consider the moral challenges involved in any effort to retrieve what has been neglected or suppressed. I'll also say that she is a gentle, kind, and generous person, and these qualities surface in her work. Thanks, Annette. Thank you. Thank you so much for coming, and thank you again for this wonderful opportunity and the invitation. So, in the background is playing a short video um, showing you the book. I also have it with me in case you want to take a look at it after the discussion. So, um, in 2007, a photo album was anonymously donated to the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum in Washington, D.C. And um, the album, which is still a unique document today, uh, contained 116 photographs of Nazis who worked in Auschwitz during the war, um, showing them in their everyday life and leisure time. Uh, none of the victims <coughs> of the people depicted are shown in the images. And uh, I focused on about uh, 30 photographs which were taken at the so-called Sola Hütte, um, holiday located or a cottage which uh, was located 30 kilometers uh, from Auschwitz. You see it here. I traveled there in 2008 when the cottage was still uh, there and it was still used as a um, holiday uh, location. 
So in the work, I uh, focus on the owner of the of the album, Karl Höcker, who was adjutant to the last commander of the Auschwitz concentration camp, and um, of course um, on the history behind the photographs and the people who are depicted on the photographs, especially at this place, uh, the Solarhütte. And um, so these are two layers in the work. And uh, another layer is my personal story. Um, Ed already mentioned it, I'm uh, of German origin. And it's um, a very important factor, especially, of course, in this work. And uh, thank you. Uh, and then there's a different layer, and that is that of uh, reproduction, how information can be lost due to reproduction. Uh, so here, for instance, you see the original contact sheet and the image, um, uh, the photo on the left, is something that is, uh, that we've, uh, the original photos here on the uh, bottom right. Um, this is one photograph that's uh, repeated throughout the book. Um, it's used on the cover as well. <laughs> Too many papers. And um, maybe you notice uh, the actual absence of a lot of uh, photographs. So in the design, um, um, I, during the project I came across um, a lot of difficulties because um, at first, as a starting point, I want, wanted to find out more information about Karl Höcker. I wanted to find different images. And um, it soon proved impossible to do that. The family didn't want to uh, cooperate. Um, information was scattered through uh, different archives in different countries and even continents. And some information was obviously just gone because of the passage of time. And this is something that we wanted to bring back in the design of the book. And uh, the design is by Hans Gemmen. And um, we did this by incorporating a varnish layer in the book. And uh, so you can have actual empty pages. Um, but also, as you can see here, you can use the space um, that you have available uh, because of the varnish layer to uh, show uh, different kinds of information. So images that are related to one another, factual information, uh, on the bottom left is my personal story that guides you through the project and also you have uh, cross-references in case you want to find out more information on this particular uh, photograph and uh, you can find it in the back. Um, so I think I'll keep it at that, okay. just short. Yeah. Sure, that's great. Yeah, thank you. That's not easy to do to narrate your own complex book, so thank you. Um, thank you. Okay, so last uh, but not least, we have uh, Linda Jang, and I'll say that, that I referred to, we have a, an, an activist, an architect, an artist at the beginning, but really part of the point is it's actually a real blend here. Those distinctions don't actually matter that much, and I think Linda embodies that. Um, so Linda's an architect, uh, an educator, and I would add author, as I've been thoroughly enjoying her writing over the past couple weeks. Um, she is currently the Bogosian Fellow here at Syracuse University School of Architecture. And her work, as I just said, is a delightful and deep blend of art and architecture. Her sensibility is sculptural, and she's invested in ambiguity, which of course is the primary tool of the artist. Um, it makes sense in this regard that she, before coming here, she worked for Oliver Elias in the studio. So, that's right. Yeah. Um, so uh, Linda will speak about a counter proposal she is making for a fascinating space in Berlin that has been the site of numerous rewritings, disappearances, and recreations. Linda is a graduate of Harvard Graduate School of Design and McGill University, and has won lots of prizes and awards, which I personally find it kind of boring to recite, but let me tell you, she's one decorated soldier. So, thanks, Linda. Thanks so much for the introduction and having me here. Um, so, for me, memory and, and history are, are two things that um, I don't think are linear or stable. Um, Ford, Maddox Ford explains this. Um, he writes, life does not say to you in 1914, my next door neighbor, Mr. Slack, er erected a greenhouse and painted it with Cox green aluminum paint. You think about the matter you will remember in various unordered pictures, 
how one day Mr. Slack appeared in his garden and contemplated the wall of his house. You will then remember the year that that occurrence happened, uh, and you will fix it as August 1914 only because you were able to afford a first class season ticket for the first time in your life. So I find inspiration in this kind of associative, partial, ghostly uh, nature of human experience. And through architecture, I explore the possibility of a correspondingly instable, ambivalent, and non-fixed understanding of subject, object, history, and identity. Uh, so I'm going to illustrate this through um, this counterproposal uh, for the currently under construction reconstruction of the Berliner Stadtschloss on uh, Museum Insel in Berlin. Um, so I'm only going to present the siting and massing um, and talk about it in relation to the two missing buildings of the site, which um, haunt the site today. Um, so it's titled Without Memory, Uncanny Reflections, and it's a speculative proposal for a third palace, uh, Congress Palast, um, so a convention center. Um, the history of site is played out over the impossible desire to center and stabilize a national identity. So this can be seen through the King's Palace on the left uh, and the Palace of the Republic on the right. And currently, uh, the Humboldt Forum, which is what is being reconstructed. Uh, this is a monument to a phone, exactly. I love that irony. So this is taken uh, this summer. So the King's Palace was constructed in the 15th century under the Prussian uh, Empire and demolished in 1950 followed, following Allied bombings and due to its supposedly impure Prussian roots. However, the real cause can be traced back to uh, 1918 uh, with the abdication of the emperor, which cast doubt on the symbolic and practical relevance of the palace. Uh, in 1973, the Palace uh, of the Republic was constructed as a parliamentary building representing the German Democratic Republic, a new identity founded on a radical break with the past. Then, following the reunification of Germany in 1990, this too lost its relevance. So by 2008, it was also demolished. And today, today they are reconstructing uh, selectively just the broke facades of the King's Palace, um, and it's being called the Humboldt Forum, a museum intended as a center of world culture. So critics have argued that the reconstruction would erase a highly significant period of German history that is fundamental to German identity. Ironically, uh, this omission is achieved by nostalgically clinging to an earlier past. Uh, so this split between radical break with the past and a nostalgic reliance on the past is, is a necessary paradox to establish identity. Um, so I, I question how we can use this co contradiction productive productively and get out of this endless cycle of remembrance and erasure. Um, Lacan's ex nihilo reading of Heidegger's vase illustrates how the vase carves out the emptiness that allows fullness to enter the world. For Freud, this emptiness is carved out not by the vase, but rather by psychic repression, allowing the possibility of being filled where the return is one of an estranged haunting. The familiar object that is repressed returns estranged and unfamiliar, and is experienced through the uncanny. So rather than literally trying to resurrect the dead through presence, uh, which would only create Frankenstein monsters, how can we use the concept of the uncanny ghost to produce a haunting absence, which allows for contradictory histories to exist together at the same time? Um, so starting with the footprints of the repressed ghosts, the lost palaces, uh, their volumes are delineated through interconnected absences rather than trying to literally reconstruct them as presences. So the volume of the king's palace um, is split into two rings that are reflected across the ground plane. The upper ring follows only half of the original palace, floating two and a half meters above the ground. The lower ring is sunken into the earth. Um, it follows the outline of the outer perimeter of the last palace, uh, merging the historic double courtyards into one interior space. On the ground level, the volumes are completely absent. They have no presence at all. They exist only above or below. The volume of the palace of the Republic is also negated across the ground plane, this time straddling it at its midpoint. The two assembly places return as voids, as courtyards which also float and interconnect with one another. The vertical displacements produce a series of ambivalently interconnected absences that span the site and place the two lost palaces into dialogue. Urbanistically, the absence on the ground demarcates a void left behind it with each demolition, extending the axis of Unten den Linden across from Tiergarten to Alexanderplatz. The floating ghostly volumes produce a void at the heart of Museum Island, allowing for the possibility of being filled, centering by decentering. 
The history of the site reveals how fragile and instable our notions of national identity and history really are, just like our memory of our neighbor, Mr. Slack, in his 1914 greenhouse. When we do not acknowledge the instability, uh, the instable quality of memory and history, what results is an endless procession of substitutions, which often are a reappropriation of history for the manifestation of political power in the name of state and national state and cultural nationalism or as institutional and neoliberal practices. While they may be initially placating, they ultimately reveal their lack. Um, against this backdrop, an architecture of present absence of the uncanny ghost opens up the possibility to simultaneously conjure and negate memory, moving beyond the literal misuse of history resulting from the contradiction of nostalgia and amnesia in the construction of identity and belonging. So those were three great presentations. I think uh, you talk and I have enough questions here to fill up the next four hours, so I hope no. Uh, we do have a lot of questions, but I think what we'll do is, is we'll ask each person one question and then open it up to the audience for questions. Uh, so you want to start? Yeah. Um, I don't know what to talk. you have spoken about the, um, the monument that the students made. Um, um, it was really interesting to see how people who did not experience the bomb tried to memorialize, tried to remember things that they don't remember, they don't experience. But that's something that we would have to do more and more because many of the hibakusha, the people who experienced the bomb, are going away. Um, what do you think is the difficulties in, in telling those stories um, after the witnesses are gone? Uh, that's a very good question. Every day, we Hiroshima people, including uh, uh, the officials, worry about how to inherit our legacy to the future generations. And then, not the only Hiroshima people, but the many students, uh, students like uh, even elementary school ch uh, children and they came uh, to hear the story from survivors and after that there are many uh, high school students even uh, elementary school children I want to do something because I will forget what I heard and then some of them holding my clothes, Keiko tell me, tell me what, the, what I can do, you know. Actually, there are such people, not only Japanese, there are so many. Then what I think, I answer, do what you can, you know, using for somebody who is good at music, you are good at music, through music, you can write the nice music or uh, write poems or a drama, you see, what you heard and imagine and make a drama and the play. But we, Hiroshima, has been doing very good uh, program. That the, it started 10 years ago. Survivors visit uh, a high school in Hiroshima and then meet uh, the, uh, the high school students who have never experienced, of course, during the war, what the, such a thing happened, but they start to tell our story to them. And uh, one survivor wants to ask them to write one picture, oil paint picture. You know, first to start, I was like that, I saw such and such and such. First, the students couldn't understand, couldn't imagine, because the story they heard for the first time was beyond their imagination. But anyway, we continue to accomplish one picture, it takes one, one year. I asked the students, five students to draw a picture, and then I had to go to the, the high school once a month. And I told my story, they draw a picture. No, 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 not like that. 
what I saw was worse than that, you know. And then talk about how people look like. So finally, some of the students started crying. I can't draw, I can't write, I can't imagine, they say. In spite of that, that someday we have to imagine by ourselves, by ourselves. So they have to overcome. You know, most of the things were uh, what we have experienced beyond their uh, imagination. But uh, continuously we, uh, we ask them and they adjust their pictures. And then finally now, 110 pictures drawn by uh, high school students they have never experienced. But the true survivor's story, they drew a picture. That's great. So in a, uh, soon I ask you to print and show uh, those pictures. This is one example. It took such a long time for one image of the picture. Such kind of you know, activity is very powerful many times. Students cried. We survivors cried. How to convey what we saw? How to convey our agony? Something like I cannot forget the one person under the crushed down house and the staring at me. I cannot forget their eyes. You know how can those high school students draw? But they may. Very good pictures, I want you to see. And uh, so you will enjoy it. Like this, we can do anything what we can do through our ability, our talent. That's the answer. Thank you. Um, in that, uh, there's an obvious difference between your relationship to trauma or catastrophe in Ms. Okura. Can you speak about the importance or the role of inserting your own voice in the story of your project development into your book? Um, in particular, how do you feel your personal narrative relates or contextualizes the underlying narrative of the Holocaust and responsibility for it? Um, so I, I um, during the project, I. Uh, was struggling a long time to sort of connect all these different layers. Uh, the historical layer, the layer of Karl Höcke, uh, reproduction and uh, loss of information due to reproduction, and um, my personal story, and actually incorporating that personal story um, allowed me to, um, yeah, to bind those layers together in a narrative um, simply by, um, by explaining how the project came about, what kind of choices I made. Um, so for me, it did, uh, it's, it served this struggle, it solved this struggle. And um, then one of the most important questions for me in the book is, uh, is what would I have done? In a similar situation, or what I what would I do uh, in present day? Um, so, throughout the book, that was a question that reappeared in the text. And um, can you repeat the last question, real quick? <laughs> the last part of the question: yeah. um, How do you feel your personal narrative relates to or contextualizes the underlying narrative of the Holocaust? Yeah, I think um, for me. Uh, of course, I'm of German background, and uh, just simply by, by telling the story. Um, my father was born in 1940, and um, throughout his life, he was struggling with his uh, heritage and uh, passed it on to me, um, especially this question how um, he always told me how proud he was to be German. And uh, when he was a kid, and uh, about all those writers, uh, musicians that were German, and only later did he find, found out about the Holocaust. 
and what exactly those people had done uh, during the war. And I think the personal, inserting a personal history like that can, um, can make it easier to access this huge, uh, huge um, questions we have about the Holocaust, which is such an enormous topic to grasp on a personal level. So I think it's, it serves, uh, on, for me, it served as a sort of um, binder to combine all these different elements as well as an access to an enormous uh, uh, history. Thank you, yeah. Um, so, so Linda, a question for you. Um, your project is not about trauma directly, and yet one of the issues that you raise is the alleged erasure of the past. And of course, this has become a very prominent topic in the United States at the moment um, with the question of the removal of Confederate statues. And so those attempting to defend the keeping of these statues, including Donald Trump, uh, invariably cite as their main, really in the face of their sole argument, that we quote unquote can't erase the past, we just can't do that, it's not, we're not allowed to, um, which of course is you know, false. Um, can you speak about your opinion of that argument in the context of your work, one, and two, uh, another compound question. And also, with your own work, what you see is the value for ambivalence and instability when it comes to public buildings that speak to or embody the past, um, particularly as it relates to the question of how history is decided. Yeah, so I think um, this question of uh, we can't erase the past, um, this is kind of exactly the paradox that I'm talking about that, is, that I see as problematic that we're not recognizing. So the idea um, that Whenever you choose to not erase one history, you, that is choosing to keep a, a certain other history. So in any case, whenever you choose any narrative, um, you're choosing that at the cost of excluding other narratives. And that's fine, and, and it, it becomes problematic when that tries to be something that's universalizing. So when we choose one narrative and decide this is the narrative for everyone, um, that is erasing another past, even though you might say, oh, by keeping that one, we're not erasing, like, you are. But this is the kind of paradox that is not being recognized. Um, so that's kind of where, for me, the ambivalence plays a role, where I'm interested, um, actually not necessarily in ambiguity, but more in ambivalence, where like, these opposing things um, can actually exist together. Um, so, you know, often if you, so this is, I don't know the answer to that yet, that's kind of what I'm, I've been, um, not yet in this project, but since then, in the, in, in the, re the last few years, um, something I've been thinking a lot about and trying to explore through um, architectural thinking in urban spaces is basically the question of, okay, so if we don't, if we want to say, if we understand the sort of uh, state agenda, the state narrative, um, as something that is universalizing and therefore necessarily violent or transgressive, um, then, okay, what do you do in that situation? I think a lot of the responses are um, the sort of bottom-up heritage, which basically says, okay, what is the most marginalized group? Let's try to give them a voice and give all of the sort of marginalized voices um, sort of some, some more power. But the problematic part of that is that it's just operating within the same structure. So ultimately, when you try to give those marginalized groups more of a voice, you're marginalizing another group. So you have Black Lives Matter, White Lives Matter, and you just kind of stay in the same power structures. There's kind of, there's, how do you get out of that? Um, so that's kind of what, where, where I'm at now and trying to use this kind of ambivalence as a way of thinking through it. Um, so it requires not thinking about history as something that is fixed and therefore definable, um, universalizable, um, and thinking about it as something that is instable. Um, but then it also requires then rethinking of the subject as something that is also not fixed or stable. And it's, it's worth noting in that regard that your proposal here is speculative. And I wonder if it would change the proposal if it if you thought it would actually be built. And it's, I understand it's, it's, it's maybe state, partially state-owned land, is that correct? So the, the, um, the, the whole project now, they made a, um, so it was kind of, yeah, it's a funny story. So um, it was, it is, they've made a new organization that is state-owned um, that is doing the reconstruction for the whole project. Um, but um, it's, the project in 2011 was 595 million euros. 
Um, and 105 million of that is being donated from a private foundation that's fundraised from um, private citizens. Um, and the owner of that is friends with lots of developers, um, and they basically did a whole kind of propaganda campaign to kind of get that project off the ground and get it going. And so it now is state-owned, um, but it didn't start that way uh, exactly. Um, and so in that context, um, you know, the, the proposals for a convention center, which is a privately owned place of gathering, um, so it is sort of um, identifying some sort of uh, problematic uh, bias of um, the state sort of does need to produce some sort of national identity um, and sort of national pride. That's, that's kind of true. I think there could be other ways that it could be done. Um, but the speculative proposal then is um, kind of operating outside of that. And yes, it would definitely be different if I ever thought that would get built. I hope that doesn't ever get built. <laughs> uh, yeah. um, well, let's, let's open it up to the audience. Um, if you're silent, we have other questions prepared, but I bet there's some questions yet. Hello. Thank you so much for sharing your stories and your work. Um, some, a question that I'm left with after hearing all um, of your work and your stories is who gets to tell these stories? Who gets to retell these stories without it being appropriative? Um, and how, I mean, you were asking these questions too about, about this, this personal violence and trauma that you experience and like when you have uh, a Western institution, for example, portraying Hiroshima, that's going to look very different, perhaps, than someone who is from Japan or from Hiroshima. Um, even the way that they have been told the history versus how we have been told the history. So I'm left with this question of who is allowed to retell those stories? Yeah, does anyone else have it? Well, you're talking, I'm going to explain that a little bit to Mr. So Vera. Yeah, so does anyone else have it? Like, but I'd love to hear Mr. Vera give it a few seconds. Does anyone else have an answer to that? Like, uh, so, for example, on that, I mean, you're. That's a good question. Are we ready? Yeah. <laughs> difficult. First, to tell our story itself is everybody don't like, you know. I hated to tell about myself and it took 50 years. So many still not, cannot speak because, you know, telling a story and what happened is not a happy thing. We are afraid of discrimination, he'll speak. So because of that, it's not the something and to tell is allowed, you know, by somebody. No. If somebody willingly wants to speak, it's okay. Because, of course, in the museum, there are certain person and, uh, uh, you know, or ask to do and there is others. But actually, Somebody want, started to talk with very difficult because we were afraid to be this. I myself had the experience that uh, so many years later when I became an eligible Keiko Hoya award. That means we are afraid of future generations. It's, it's good not to tell our, ourselves. People were afraid to get married, such a person. So in my elementary school, all classmates stopped to talk that they were in the city. And some of them were discriminated. Oh, I mean, spoke ill. So now it continues. And so it's difficult to imagine, but that's true. Because the nuclear weapon is quite different from other conventional weapons. We are afraid of future generations, our future. Grandchildren and the great grandchildren, we are afraid. So, uh, but still, 
and we need somebody. So city certified uh, such a such a person uh, that should be uh, the storyteller. And the main, uh, so the city asked for hold Japan. If somebody wants to become uh, inherit the story of survivors, and then they have special training, like three years, know everything about it because they don't know what happened actually. If they change the story, story changes, and in the future, what will happen? But I don't like such such kind of system. I shouldn't say so because I feel like a grown person, you see. Some other people may be okay, but there are many. There is a person who wants to inherit your story, but I feel like my personal uh, opinion, we should have videotape or something, the true story by true person who are witness, not somebody hearing the story and they become, I am Keiko Ura. No. <laughs> That's so bad. So, what we should do, as many as possible, making a video tape and a film, and then showing that. And then, other person, you know, explain, you know. I know Keiko Ura. She was like this, look at this. But if you have any question related to those days, I will answer. How we could get the food, how we could do the medical treatment, like that. I should do that, but right now, and the city has a project, and they're keeping that project. There are so many people in here. And somehow it's good, but I don't like, I don't want to be somebody from Keiko Ogura in the future. One of the things we've talked a lot about in our class is the fact that Hiroshima, in particular, and the Holocaust, too, I suppose, is is two things at once. You know, it's, it's an event in which something really terrible happened to specific people, but it's also at this point it's, it's a symbol. It's a, a word that is abstracted. The way that that say a film like Hiroshima Monomore uses Hiroshima is very different than I think what, what Ms. Oguro would talk about in terms of Hiroshima. And so it's really a, a matter, from my perspective, and we can debate this, or maybe other people have a different opinion that it's about finding your own authentic relation to that if you want to take it on as a topic. And that's something we've tried to do as a class. <laughs> I think that comes across in your work too, in that. I mean, the way that you approach this topic of the Holocaust, as I said earlier, has a lot of restraint to it. And I think it's an appropriate restraint. You know? and, and maybe just adding, I think it's, it's a really important question, but then at least in the Netherlands, for instance, there's not a lot of discussion going on about uh, the colonial history of, of the Netherlands, and it's a, a history, especially from uh, Indonesia, that has been long neglected, and uh, is just, yeah, really only in recent years, a sort of point of discussion. And, but I think to sort of, and that's, uh, I think in the same, line of what you were saying earlier, if you, uh, if you only allow one uh, narrative, you exclude another. So I think, um, because now in the Netherlands there's this, this really um, yeah, hard discussion, you know, how should we talk about this and was allowed to talk about it. But I think one really important thing is to stay in conversation and to acknowledge that a lot of histories have long been neglected, are not part of what is taught at schools, uh, not in history books, and that we have to change that collectively um, is, I think, very important. I, th I think in, in architecture, um, this question becomes really important because we don't always practice in the neighborhood that we grew up in, right? So we're always practicing in other people's communities. Um, which necessarily means we have some role to play in choosing other people's histories or other stories to tell. Um, so this is kind of um, something I, I obviously don't have an answer to, but I have, this is kind of what I've been thinking about the last while. So um, one of the last projects that I was working on, still figuring out, 
um, is with a collaborator of mine. She's an anthropologist. Um, so we were working with the community in which she lives. Uh, she does a lot of work with oral histories. And so the idea was to try to work with oral histories and to, from all of the, that cacophony of contradictory individual <coughs> personal life stories, um, sort of figure out a way that that would produce a sort of different type of um, architecture in relation to heritage. Um, and that was kind of the starting point. But what, was, what kind of came out of that was something really different because what you realize is maybe not the solution, but you realize certain things that um, you definitely don't want to do, which is you don't want to be the one who's selecting which voices get heard. You also don't want to produce some universalizing structure to compare them all to each other because they also then sort of lose um, their ability. Um, so we're, we're still, you know, working through it, um, but the kind of current state of, the sort of last stage of where that project was, was basically uh, an installation where we tried to put all of these different um, dialogues together against um, the state narrative. Um, and then basically we didn't curate the personal stories because you couldn't, we had no authorship about them. Uh, and they became just the legend um, through which you would use to navigate the space. Um, and, and, and kind of like you were saying, um, that they're, they become the thing that gives you access to this kind of um, really complicated web of different layers of information and um, not, not just information, but kind of you know, social, um, political, cultural, financial, all of these different forces, how you navigate that complicated web um, and understand it. Uh, we tried to position that through a bunch of different life stories and you could follow anyone's personal story to go through and, and try to understand those things together. Um, but that was that's still not yet architecture. Um, so, so how we get there, I don't know yet. Um, but it's just more of um, maybe what I can say maybe more definitively only a few things not to do, which is really this deciding for someone else um, and trying to equate them or universalize them in, in any way. I, that those are sort of problematic. So I'd love to take one more question from the audience. Uh, fortunately, we have time for one more, but as usual, it's, a, it's a, one of those things. Discussion should carry on afterwards. So I see two hands. Oh, got, sorry, you got him first. Thank you. Thanks to our three guests for visiting our campus. And uh, I have a question specifically for Ms. Ogura. And my question is, what was the day pre preceding to the explosion of the bomb? What was your life immediately before the event, and where were you? Thank you. Thank you. Just before, we did not know anything. There was not the air raid one. All of a sudden, and then I experienced the flash at the same time the blast attacked. Everybody became unconscious. I was hit on the ground, and they became unconscious. And then when I opened my eyes, everywhere was just dark. I thought that, that was already evening. That's the immediate after that. But everybody thought that uh, our area was the target because everything was so, so strong, you see? And then everybody thought we were unlucky, this area. And then, but actually, we couldn't believe a single bomb destroyed the city. At the first, everybody thought and the city should be and attacked hundreds and hundreds of bombs. But we wonder first, we couldn't see hundreds of uh, airplanes. We couldn't see airplanes, why it happened? Uh, that was instantly devastated. And then instantly, uh, the people, you know, inside, within the radius uh, 1,000 meter, and 60% died, and the Central Park people died. And the previous night was so strange. And then uh, some of the story, not so many people don't know, because previous night, around midnight, there was unusual arid warning. Not usual, you know. We are sleeping, all of a sudden, around midnight, 
all of a sudden there was an air raid warning. We jumped up and then tried to uh, get into the shelter, waited. Nothing happened. Then we tried to sleep again, and then uh, all of a sudden, and there was another air raid warning. It continued in the morning too. But nothing happened that the previous night and the American airplane came and they're doing the sur survey of the, uh, the weather and so on. And then next day, and then there was no air raid one. We are happy in the bright morning. All of a sudden it happened. But uh, the truth is like this. Previous night, many times, and B-29 appeared above Hiroshima, and the people were exhausted, especially in the shelter, in the bunker. There was a bunker in the center part of the, uh, the park and the, where the military base was. And then soldiers didn't sleep at all. But the airplane appeared, but they disappeared. But did it mean? Couldn't understand. And then one of the soldiers stepped out in charge of this particular red one in the morning. Nothing happened. I will have a rest. And he stepped out. To tell the truth, in the bunker where they dispatched the red one, 15 years old, 30 girls were working with soldiers. So at the end of the war, there was not enough personality, persons. So girls were rotated 24 hours, one time 30 girls were work, working. That means when the bomb was dropped, outside of the bunker, there were 30 girls. They died waiting for switch the, the, the duty, you see. And then, actually, when airplane came, there was not the commander who was in charge of this particular one. And then there was a low rank soldier. And he did not know what shall we do. And the girls were screaming. All of a sudden, they found in the morning, oh, there is a, a you know, B-29. They could know because all the girls had a receiver. And why I know this story is, witness, uh, she was uh, operator of that bunker to dispatch the air and wine, he switched to, and then she was there, and then there was no person. And then, oh, here comes the airplane, airplane, and then bomb was dropped. All of a sudden it appeared. So that's the reason Hiroshima people did not know anything about. It's caused by the whole, you know, Japanese military. Yes, I think so. And uh, that was the hit of so many years, I think. But uh, this is a true story. Okay? So I think we should end it here, but <clears throat> I want to note that, um, so as I mentioned, Ms. Oguro is, uh, it will be in conversation at the Eberson on Thursday night, and also available here in the Marble Room on October 30th. For scheduled conversations, you have to sign up for that. Also, she will tell the full story of her experience uh, at the attack uh, at the symposium on Saturday. So that, that her opening address starts at 9 o'clock, and it's in the uh, Slocum Hall Auditorium. So if you're interested in hearing her story in full, um, with visuals, I suggest you come to that. Um, so now uh, we'll break, and we'll have the reception in the auditorium. Go on. Go on. Yeah, so I want to thank everyone again. Uh, thank you all for coming out tonight. Uh, really, really moving, uh, terrific presentations. Um, we will open the show, uh, and the show consists of uh, a Maruki uh, print that was also at the Everson Museum, uh, and it was moved here, and, um, and also a really exquisite um, cabinet uh, filled with books, all of which are either about Hiroshima or about other events in the same time period. Um, so we'll open up now, and uh, as was suggested earlier, on the 30th we'll have um, all-day conversations with Ms. Uh, in, uh, in the
marble room. So thank you all again. And uh, we'll end this part and we'll open the show. Thank you.